Thanks so much for the brilliant introduction. Uh, GD, I really appreciate it. Also, thanks for the invite to be here with you guys tonight. It's a great pleasure to be in this uh, great panel, particularly to be in the company of Ben Schneiderman. I've been a long fan of, of his work, of course, and I was very uh, happy that he accepted to do a very kind introduction a forward of my latest book, The Book of Trees, which uh, you know filled me with joy. Uh, so today I'm going to try to encapsulate some of my research topics in 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, and the title of this talk is called Visualization Metaphors, and it really talks about this human desire for unraveling the big picture through visualization. I'm quickly going to take you back a few hundred years ago. I'm going to take you back to I, the high Middle Ages in Europe. And this was actually a really interesting, very fruitful period uh, in medieval Europe, where scholars were experimenting with a variety of visual metaphors to convey complex topics, not even too dif different from many of the projects that Ben Schneidman showed, but this was you know, back again in you know, 800 years ago, if not more. And this was also a time, and this is like some of the beautiful diagrams and charts that we're creating at the time, many of them very experimental. They didn't add sort of no guidebook for visualizing a lot of these uh, complex topics. They were really, really experimenting and breaking uh, sort of new ground with a lot of this work. Uh, this was also the time of the first large universal encyclopedias, really trying to encapsulate the whole of human knowledge. Uh, this beautiful piece, it's actually part of the Nuremberg Chronicle, actually surfaced many of the, the first time where actually that many European cities were visualized, were depicted in a graphical form. So it was really, really relevant at the time. And of course, during this period, you also have Athanasius Kircher. If you, I don't know if you're familiar with, the, with his work, but he was obsessed about depicting the entirety of human knowledge in a diagrammatic fashion. And uh, his work is uh, immense. There's like volumes and volumes of volumes of charts like this one, uh, like the ones that you see in this slide, which is remarkable in many different ways. But it was really interesting that from all the different metaphors that people were exploring back then, that seemed that one particular metaphor surfaced and was probably the most powerful one, the most long-lasting of all visual metaphors that people were playing with. And this metaphor was a metaphor of the tree, the tree diagram. And many of you might ask, why trees? Why, from all the different uh, metaphors that we're playing with, why were trees like so long-lasting, during to this day, in fact? Uh, even when we talk about tree maps, for instance, the, the trees were the predecessors of tree maps. Well, there, there are various reasons for, for that to, to have happened. Uh, but perhaps one of the most important ones is that trees have been important religious symbols uh, across space and time. There's only one single religion across the world, across uh, space and time, that hasn't revered some type of sacred tree, uh, the famous tree of life. We can see trees of life or sacred trees going back to ancient Sumer and Babylon. Uh, we can see them in ancient Egypt. Yeah, they actually revered various types of sacred trees. You can see, of course, the famous Kabbalah tree, the tree of life from Judaism. There's, of course, in Christianity, not only just one tree portrayed in the Bible, but two trees, the tree of life and the tree of good and evil. Even Buddhism, of course, adds its famous Bodhi tree, on the which Siddhartha Gautama attained enlightenment. It's this really critical, the fig tree. If you guys go to Asia, you probably have, many of you, you will see fig trees decorated because they have a very sort of significance for a lot of the people that believe uh, in this sacred important tree of life. Even Mayas themselves add the famous Mayan tree of life, also known as the Yashche. It, was, it had this sort of interesting cross shape, and it was n known to be the, the famous Axis Mundi, unifying the three uh, uh, sacred worlds of the Mayans. Perhaps because of this reason, perhaps because trees have been so important, sort of celestial almost creatures and beings, throughout civilizations across time and space, at some point they also became important knowledge classification tools. They became important communication tools, right? Uh, systematizing and, and communicating and conveying different aspects of human knowledge. And we can see this in a variety of aspects. We can see this going back to mapping morality. So trees were being uh, used as visual metaphors to display different aspects of, of human morality, like the, you have many times the tree of virtues and the tree of vices, basically depicting what you should do I mean what you should not do. And it's actually really interesting that sometimes the tree of sins is normally sick and dying, like the one you see on the right side, uh, while the tree, of, uh, with the tree of virtues is normally very upright and very exuberant. So they even have that sort of interesting, intricate metaphors that they play within many of these illustrations. Uh, 
you of course have probably the most known sort of archetype of the tree diagram, which is of course mapping blood ties between people, uh, mapping genealogy uh, or consanguinity. And these have been long lasting sort of memes throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, and they were important sort of tools for many of the, of the people conveying these particular charts. One of the things that I recently uncovered during my research for my latest book was how trees have also been used to map systems of law, even going back to ancient Rome, actually, the earliest uh, sort of attorneys and then and law professionals were actually using trees to convey a series of decrees, mandates, laws, and proclamations, again, using the tree metaphor on and on and on. In fact, the one that you see on the right side, just above that diagram, there's a, an interesting quote in Latin, which I'm going to read. Since the matter of this title is too intricate, difficult, and complex to explain, it might be easier to comprehend using the figurative art of a trunk. So here you have a very sort of, uh, the statement of the artist, of the designer, of the illustrator in this case, a very intentional pursuit of using the tree diagram because it was easier for people to understand uh, this particular decree that he was uh, depicting. Uh, of course, trees have been also used by, to map different areas of knowledge known to man, uh, different areas of science. Uh, Ramon Lull was perhaps the main precursor of this idea that all of science is a tree. And his thoughts were, of course, picked up by Descartes, later on by Francis Bacon, and even more recently by Leibniz. And some of these ideas are remarkable in the sense that today we use it all the time, this particular metaphor that genetics is a branch of science or biology is a branch of science. Like This sort of idea, this metaphor, is so ingrained in our heads, but we own it to Ramon Lull was the first really considered knowledge or science uh, as a tree. And of course, we see trees also being used to map different aspects of, of science itself, right? In this case, biology. In this case, mapping species. Uh, Darwin was actually the very only illustration that Darwin had in the book, The Origin of Species, was actually only one single illustration, was known as the tree of life. And there's a passage from Darwin to the publisher saying how critical it was to include this particular illustration in the book, because it was central to his entire thinking, his entire theory on, on evolution. And picking on, on Darwin's work, Ennis Eckel was a famous uh, sort of German biologist. He was a famous advocate of Darwin. He actually created a variety of different trees mapping different species. Some, some of them actually encompassing all species known to man at the time, others concentrating on various specific species and subspecies. So trees, as you guys just saw in, my, in this quick rambling, has been, they have been a really interesting sort of diagram, a really, again, interesting communication tool for many, many, many centuries. And they actually continue to, uh, to map a variety of topics through that process, and they continue to evolve. They went through various sort of Cambrian explosions on their own, like where different species were sort of born from this sort of new thinking, right? So here was probably the first Cambrian explosion of the tree diagram where people became aware that they could convey the hierarchical logic of a tree without all its sort of uh, embellishments, without all the leaves and, and branches and, and fruits that many of those you know, early illustrations had. And this opened a huge door for trees to become more diagrammatic, more uh, abstract. And, more, and these are many of the node link diagrams that we see nowadays. Another Cambrian explosion was probably the one caused by Ben Schneiderman himself by creating the tree map, which, as he was uh, speaking earlier, it opened the door to a variety of new species of trees being created. Not just the regular sort of rectangular tree maps, but also Voronoi tree maps, circle tree maps, and others that are keep on growing and, and, and expanding. But what's really interesting as well is that even though trees have been important, sort of an important communication tool throughout many centuries and they keep on evolving, at the same time, it feels like we are facing this paradigm shift where trees as a communication tool are not really able to comprehend, to explain, to convey the inherent complexities of our modern world, of our modern society, of, my, of, of the modern challenges we are facing. And it seems like many of the tree diagrams are being replaced with a new metaphor, in this case, the metaphor of a network. And we see these important transitions in many different areas. Here we see, again, the idea of mapping human knowledge, the all areas of science known to man, these are actually maps of Wikipedia, of mapping different articles in Wikipedia and the interlinkage that a lot of those articles share between themselves. And here, the metaphor being used is, again, not the tree, is, is a network. Because, of course, the more we realize and comprehend human knowledge, we realize it's not a tree at all in the sense that it's 
very decentralized and all interconnected and, and interdependent. We also see this mapping in this particular project, again, using the, now the, the network metaphor instead of the tree. This one is actually visualizing all the cross-references of all the characters portrayed in the Bible. So the theme, yeah, as you notice here, is pretty much the same as many of the medieval illustrations you saw before. Uh, many of those illustrations are, of course, of biblical stories and characters and so on. But in this case, they are using the same sort of topic, but using a, an entirely different metaphor, the metaphor of, of the network. Uh, as, I, as I was talking before, uh, our trees were being, of course, mapped, used to map uh, relationships between people, blood ties between people. Now we see the network sort of coming in and stepping, and stepping in and, and replacing trees in that process. Uh, the own, you know, you're very famous with social networks and visualizing social networks, many of the, the remarkable online social, social networks that we currently have, which are amazing labs for social sciences in the sense that now, for the first time, we can map complex, complex communities in the order of millions and millions of people. And we are using the network to actually visualize a lot of those inherent complexities. Uh, so this is actually an interesting map between uh, be actually depicting online social collaboration between Perl developers, which is a programming language, as they actually work together on a variety of projects, as they share files and so on. And here we can see how it is, it is again, highly decentralized, really much more, much more like a network. And of course, you always have, you also have, uh, other new, more recent systems uh, and topics, like this one, uh, mapping terrorism. Terrorism, of course, since September 11, has been a huge sort of pursuit. A lot of money and effort and time has been invested in trying to depict uh, terrorism and terrorist cells and networks and so on. Perhaps the main reason why it is so hard for us to understand it, it is because it's, it's a decentralized system. It is a network structure. There's no leader, per se, in many of these organizations. So visualization has continuously stepped in using, again, the, the network metaphor to try to visualize and convey the generic intricacies of, of, of these systems. And finally, you have many projects trying to map the internet, different aspects of the internet, the physical structure of the internet, of servers and IP addresses, machines, but also the, the overlaying structure, the World Wide Web itself. All the, all the websites are interconnected. And there's a variety of different visualizations here. This is just one of many, many more that exist. And it's really interesting that this almost resembles uh, the Americas of the, 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 the 1500s, right? It was this fascination for this new territory that was never mapped before, that was never depicted before. And all designers and scientists are trying to depict this in the best way possible. And some of the networks that you just saw are part of a long sort of collection. And Ben Schneidman mentioned the, the, my website before of visualcomplexity.com. Uh, and later on, on my first book, I actually created these 15 categories or typologies or methodologies or approaches that people are using to de depict and visualize networks. Many more exist, but these are probably the most, uh, the most interesting ones, the ones that are most popular by, by people across, across the globe. Uh, but finally, and in my, next, in my last segment of this talk, I would also like to touch the, a really interesting point which is that networks are not just only in a scientific pursuit. In, the sa in many ways, uh, networks as, uh, as, a, as a system, also as a visual metaphor, are actually contaminating many tradi traditional art fields. Uh, many traditional painters and sculptures are actually being influenced by this, this, this critical new structure. Uh, to the point that maybe we are actually entering, uh, or at least uh, witnessing uh, the birth of a new movement, which I call networkism, for lack of a better term. But it's really interesting to see how networks are really becoming, again, a culture meme, contaminating many traditional art fields. And these are just a couple of slides that highlight this sort of cross-pollination of ideas, this, this fear of influence between science and art. So as many designers, as many scientists and data visualizers are trying to depict a lot of these complex systems, they are, again, in many ways contaminating uh, uh, other artists. So here's an interesting uh, comparison. On the left side, you have IP mapping, which is a computer-generated map of IP addresses, machines, servers. And on the right side, you have transient structures and unstable networks, which is a painting by Sharon Malloy. It's all on animal and animal on canvas. And I think the influence is pretty self-explanatory. Here you have another interesting uh, comparison. On the left side, you have another computer-generated uh, 
um, app uh, of online, uh, a non social network called Operation Smile. And on the right side, you have Field 4 by Emma McNally using graphite on paper. And this interesting quote is by one of the artists leading this movement, by Sherry Malloy, who says, My quest is to reveal how everything is interconnected, from the atom to the cell to the body and behind into society and the cosmos. There are underlying process, processes, structures and rhythms that are mirrored all around and permeate reality. What I found really interesting about this particular quote is that Anyone familiar with uh, complex science and, and network science could actually find this a very similar code in a book by, let's say, Albert Bar Bar Barabasi, one of the key leading figures of complex science. It seems as, as if the, the pursuit, the goal, the ambition of artists is exactly the same as physicists and scientists trying to unravel the inherent complexities of many of these, these intricate systems. Here are paintings by, uh, by, the, by Sherry Malloy, who I just quoted. Uh, again, transient structures and unstable networks. And here you have a few pieces by Emma McNally. I think here the influence uh, from network science is really obvious. Uh, she has this really intense graphite work on paper that, and some of her, pe uh, of her pieces are immensely, immensely uh, uh, enticing. I, I don't think I'm actually doing justice by just showing these, these few paintings. Uh, but what's also interesting about networkism as a movement, if there is such, is that it doesn't happen in two dimensionals alone. Uh, here is how networkism can happen in three dimensions. This is perhaps one of my favorite projects uh, of, of networkism. And I think the title really says it all. It's called Galaxies Forming Along Filaments Like Droplets Along the Strands of a Spider's Web. And I've never been to one of those installations myself, but the, the author really fills these long, huge spaces with, uh, with uh, this black elastic ropes. And apparently, as you actually move throughout the space, as you bounce on one of those ropes, the entire network reverberates, right? It changes. It morphs almost as a, as a real physical network, which I think is very poetic in many different ways. And if there is a movement, I think uh, Japanese artist uh, Shiaru Shiota takes it to a whole different level. Uh, this is a piece called In Silence, and she has many of similar pieces. And she fills spaces with this dense, a uh, web of elastic ropes uh, and black woolen trowels, sometimes including objects, as you see here, sometimes even including people. And I think she takes this movement, this tendency to a whole different level. So I think this covers many of the topics that I'm fascinated about, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions during the panel. Thank you.